Um, I, I think we are lined up, Rigo. Uh, Great. All right. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, another very interesting Friday event, but another year, um, 2022. Uh, hopefully, everyone had a great um, New Year, and everyone is ready to start a new year with a lot of good uh, resolution uh, expectations. So I have some. Uh, I'm sure, Dr. Guy, you have some. So uh, this is uh, American Surgery Center Bariatric Program. My name is Kamal Arkan. Today is uh, January 7th, and this is our first session of 2022. Um, a lot of people aren't familiar with what we do uh, already, but um, this is going to be the third cycle of our topics. Uh, we are trying to cover them in different ways, uh, having the discussion uh, around the uh, challenges and the process of the bariatric uh, surgery, and we have the expert, Dr. Ergan, with us. Dr. Ergan, how are you doing? Very well, Kamal. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to Bariatric Friday. Happy New Year, everybody. Uh, and uh, looking forward to another great session. Thank you, Dr. Ergan. So we are going to, uh, I'm going to actually introduce uh, everyone again uh, to make sure that we are uh, covering all the uh, they're giving all the options. Um, so uh, Dr. Ergan, who's uh, on a regular basis with us on uh, Bariatric Fridays, uh, Dr. Gail Wynn, um, one of the most um, uh, talented female surgeon in the world. Um, Dr. Mike Peters, a great surgeon uh, since 2005 with uh, Krias. Dr. Uh, Raul Singh, uh, who joined us in 2014. Dr. George Ibrahim is one of our junior uh, partners. And finally, we have Dr. Sachin Wade, who is a colorectal surgeon, who is part of the team. Uh, this team works with um, four dietitians, uh, Fran, uh, who is uh, part of the program since the beginning of the ACO side of bariatric, Bat Wright, and Amy Wilkinson, and finally we have Amy Scott who joined us in uh, November 2021. And this is the uh, the team approach uh, that we have uh, for uh, uh, for these uh, sessions and for these uh, for those patients who are going through this process. Uh, the group uh, is. Uh, by far, who, which is one of the most experienced group in bariatric. Um, we do highlight this every time we talk about it, just because uh, surgery and uh, the expertise, they are going hands in hands, and it's extremely important to be in the right hands. So, and we are here to uh, help everyone. These sessions are available on our YouTube channels. And... Um, and then today we are going to talk about type of bariatric cases. So, uh, Dr. Rila, if you can please uh, provide the uh, brief background on the qualification and then the benefit of bariatric surgery, uh, then we'll start the, uh, uh, the type of procedures. Absolutely. So, bariatric surgery is a surgical treatment for uh, morbid obesity. So, morbid obesity is defined as a weight which is at least 100 pounds above a person's ideal body weight. So if a person's ideal body weight is, for instance, 150 pounds because their height is 5'4 or 5'5, and if that person were to gain 100 pounds and now their weight is 250 pounds, that would be the definition of morbid obesity. Another way to look at it would be to talk about body mass index. Body mass index is a calculated number that takes into account the height and the weight of the person. And then that calculation leads to this number. And in a normal body mass index, you have 18 to 25. When it is greater than 25, but below 30, you talk about a person being overweight. If it's between 30 to 35, you talk about class one obesity. If it's greater than 35, but below 40, you talk about class two obesity. And then if it's greater than 40, you talk about morbid obesity. So. 40 is the number we're looking at. If you calculate your body mass index, you see that number, then it means that the weight really has gone to really extreme levels affecting the health of the person as well. And that's where bariatric surgery is recommended. Sometimes even a body mass index below 40 can 
qualify a person for bariatric surgery if that person has already developed illnesses related to obesity, like uh, Kamal has put up on this slide, for instance, on the right side, we have this slide demonstrating what kind of illnesses can arise as a result of obesity. And there are multiple, multiple illnesses. So for instance, if a person has high blood pressure, sleep apnea, or type two diabetes, and their body mass index is 35, 36, 37, but below 40, then we say there's no need to wait until that person becomes sicker at a higher body mass index, bariatric surgery should be applied earlier. So bariatric surgery is a surgical treatment, very appropriate treatment for a very serious disease, which is morbid obesity. And as you see with the slide here, morbid obesity comes with many afflictions that can affect any organ system, starting from the top of the head, all the way down to the toes of the person. Any organ system can be affected. And because of that, treatment is necessary. And that treatment is bariatric surgery. So, uh, Dr. Gal, we do actually go through this uh, in a different session um, specifically, but uh, the four comorbidity, four illnesses that comes with, in some cases, with um, uh, obesity that qualifies a patient to morbid obesity. But the benefit of uh, having the surgery is uh, endless. Uh, and this actually is one of those slides that one of the pictures that we share. Um, many of the issues are originated from obesity. And, you know, it's one of my uh, difficulties or maybe challenges that I'm so, uh, you know, struggling with uh, when we see the treatment options of diabetes and hypertension, uh, if the BMI is left alone and not being approached, uh, that's a huge problem because those issues are most likely originated from obesity or morbid obesity. And we see our patients when they don't get the um, treatment in a uh, timely manner, then they always come back with uh, 10, 15, 20% more with their original uh, weight that they were uh, approaching this. Now, in terms of the um, procedures, uh, Dr. Gao, um, if you can uh, go through those, uh, just to explain why someone would pick one uh, versus the other or why you would actually uh, recommend one versus the other. Uh, so these are different procedures that we are uh, doing at CREAS. Absolutely. So Absolutely. So let's start with the lab band, uh, or if, yes. you want to, if you want to go back to the overalls and then explain, that's fine as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. So if um, you look at all the pictures on this slide, essentially they are showing us a component of the digestive system. And bariatric surgery really is an intervention that changes, rearranges, or introduces something in the digestive tract. That's really the essence of bariatric surgery. And there are different ways of doing it. Some of them are less invasive, others are more invasive. So if we start through the picture on the lower right side with the gastric balloon, for instance, you can see we have a procedure which is the least invasive where we're not really doing any incisions on the skin. We are introducing a balloon through the mouth, through the natural opening of the person, through the mouth, and then depositing this balloon into the stomach to mimic sensation of fullness. Then if you go to the picture on the left upper quadrant, I love the upper corner, we see the lap band, which is another one, which is less invasive. It's more invasive than the balloon, but less invasive than the other procedure. And that's the lap band procedure. And then from there, we go to the sleeve gastrectomy, where now we do something even more involved because we're cutting the stomach. And then you go to something like gastric bypass, where not only you cut the stomach, but also you rearrange the intestine. And then finally, you go to the duodenal switch or the DS uh, in the, uh, on that uh, position there, where not only you rearrange the intestine, but you rearrange it extensively. So let's start with the uh, less uh, 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 invasive procedure that you had on your slide. Like we can talk about the lab band uh, first. So with the lab band, what we do, essentially is we place a belt around the upper portion of the stomach. And that belt acts almost like an, uh, an, an, an obstruction to the passage of food so that the person doesn't eat a lot of food at any one time. This constriction that we place around the upper portion of the stomach can be adjusted without repeating the surgery because there is this little port that is placed right underneath the skin and this would be on the person's uh, right under the skin. Uh, on absolutely, the... absolutely. <coughs> Excuse me. And that 
uh, tightness can be adjusted by injecting or removing fluid from that pore. So that's the lap band. How often it's done, the lap band is not as done as commonly as we used to do it in the past. We find that many bands are not tolerated well by people and we end up removing many of them. But there are still some bands that we placed even 10, 15 years ago that are still working well for some people. <coughs> so now uh, while Dr. Rida is getting some water and uh, getting his voice back. So um, the gastric <laughs> sleep is right now, 75% uh, of our procedures are gastric sleep. That, that's the most common. Uh, and from the patient standpoint, from the surgeon standpoint as well, and just just to kind of let people know when I taught like several years ago when I started with the uh, bariatric surgery uh, on the uh, healthcare management side, I thought the sleeve the term sleeve was kind of misleading. <laughs> I thought we were actually when we cut the stomach, we were just making wrapping the smaller wrapping part. it. <laughs> yeah, so, and that's yeah. not the. That's okay. not the sleeve that's being um, uh, mentioned here. So, Dr. Kaffi can educate us. So, what is the answer? The sleeve gastrectomy essentially is a reshaping of the stomach. So, the stomach, this large organ that looks like a watermelon, we cut it all the way starting from the top to the bottom so that a portion of the stomach that we call the greater curvature is actually removed completely from the body. And the person is left with a much narrower portion of the stomach that is not only smaller, but it's also stiffer, which means that its ability to accommodate easily a lot of food is very limited. So at any one time, a person will be able to eat only a small amount of food and they will not be hungry as frequently either. So that's the essence of the sleep. And it's very common, it's very popular. One, because it intuitively makes sense to people, right? My stomach is big, we're removing a portion of the stomach, I'm gonna eat less, it makes sense but also it works, it works very well. Now, um, part of this sleeve, uh, when we take this uh, portion, this is the portion also makes us more uh, hungry. So um, it was a, uh, one of those aha moments for me. Um, it's not just making the stomach smaller, but uh, taking some of the access that actually signals the brain uh, that actually makes us less hungry. Dr. Riga, if you, um, uh, if you can kind of elaborate that, so what part of that, uh, why, why we are less hungry when we, that part is taken, uh, taken out? Absolutely, so it turns out that what we're doing is not purely mechanical. In other words, we're not just making the stomach smaller to reduce the volume, but we're actually interfering with some of the communications that occur between the digestive tract and the brain in a beneficial way. In other words, when our digestive tract works, it communicates a lot with our brain to determine our level of fullness and also our rate of metabolism. And by removing this portion of the stomach, we're actually interfering with that because some of the cells that, for instance, produce some of the uh, signals of hunger, like ghrelin, reside in this large part of the stomach that we removed. So interestingly, very often we will see, and you will see them also come out in many of our patients, particularly early after surgery, patients will tell you they're not hungry at all. In fact, sometimes they have to remind themselves to it, meaning that those single signals that act so vigorously in a normal situation, now they are completely obliterated. So mm -hmm. the changes that we're making are not purely mechanical. There are changes that are also metabolic, but these metabolic changes are very beneficial. They're healthier because they lead that person to actually utilize their own fat for their energy needs, and therefore that person will be losing weight. But also we see changes in the other metabolic illnesses that are instigated by obesity. So as we said earlier on, and as you showed it with your slide, you are showing us, for instance, that with obesity, a person starts developing all sorts of illnesses, cardiovascular, metabolic, and others, right? It turns out when we do these surgeries, irrespective of the weight loss, the person becomes metabolically healthier as well. We do see improvement, for instance, in the regulation of blood sugar. We do see changes in the regulation of blood pressure, again, very early after the person has the procedure as well. That's why 
we call ourselves not just bariatric surgery that induce weight loss, but we're also bariatric and metabolic surgeries because we're mm -hmm. also making changes in the metabolism of the person, which is a key factor when we're trying to get people healthier uh, with weight loss. Sure. Now, um, less common, but another procedure that we do is uh, gastric bypass. Um, and then I have some follow-up questions after you uh, explain what gastric bypass is. Absolutely. So gastric bypass, which is a procedure that, as you know, uh, myself and my associates have done a lot of before the gastric sleeve became more popular in the last 10 years. Um, gastric bypass <clears throat> is a different procedure because here, not only we are partitioning the stomach to create a small stomach that receives the food, but actually we are rearranging the flow of food in the intestine as well. So we're cutting the intestine and we are repositioning the intestine. So as you can see in the second picture, where you, the changes have occurred, you see the blue arrows now showing you what the path of food will be. The food that is eaten will follow that blue arrow now. It will go down into the small stomach and then into the intestine directly. The larger portion of the stomach and the early portion of the intestine will be isolated from the pathway of the food, right? We are bringing the intestine from here to connect right? so, absolutely that's exactly what we're doing so the food instead of going to the larger stomach into the early intestine in a normal anatomy now it will be diverted directly into the intestine it's almost as if it's bypassing the larger stomach and bypassing the in the intestine that's why it's called bypass right so this is a fundamentally different procedure precisely because of the rerouting of the intestine well what are the implications well the implications as we can see from a weight loss point of view, are that you have a small stomach, so you eat fast food, right? But importantly, that early portion of the intestine, which is so active in digesting the food, now is not seeing the food anymore. So the digestion of the food will be slowed down considerably. So our ability to absorb whatever we've eaten is also interfered with. So not only we're eating less, but what we are eating also is processed and reabsorbed much more slowly. That's why we end up intaking less calories. That is really the essence of gastric bypass. So, so it's almost like there's no stomach uh, left. Like there's very small portion of the part that's left. Um, now it's, it's kind of like the big part of it, the, the, um, from the part that we cut in the yes. sleeve, we are taking that part out. Yes. In here, in the, uh, in the gastric bypass, it stays in. Stays in, yes, so, it stays in. Uh, now, the, uh, the cutting part is, uh, we, we get these questions a lot from the patients, right? So um, which one is right for me? Is it sleeve or is it bypass? But uh, overall, the understanding of uh, these procedures, if we have to kind of just put the sleeve and the bypass together from the severity standpoint or the life-changing standpoint, uh, uh, standpoint, sleeve is lower than bypass. Is that correct? Slow, sleeve is less impactful, meaning that there are less changes on the natural order of the organs, right? We're yeah. doing less changes. Yeah. With the gastric bypass, we're doing more changes, right? Now, more does not mean more all the time, right? Mm -hmm. Meaning that just because a person has had gastric bypass instead of the sleeve, does not mean they're going to lose more weight automatically. That's important to understand. In fact, if you look at long-term studies that have compared the two procedures, you can see, yes, there is a little bit more weight loss with the bypass, but it's not significantly higher, sure. right? Now, there are some advantages of gastric bypass when you compare them with the sleep, but it's not necessarily with the weight loss itself, right? So when you have somebody who's coming in with a body mass index of 42, Otherwise, you know, they may have high blood pressure, they may have sleep apnea, but they don't have severe heartburn or anything like that. That person could do very well with the sleeve, which is something that doesn't require a lot of changes, right? In fact, interestingly, Kamal, what, one thing I tell people is that the gastric bypass as a procedure is almost like a last stop procedure. There's nowhere you can go after that. Exactly. Next question. So like, 
I can do sleeve, and if some somehow it doesn't work, I can actually try the bypass, but I cannot do the other way around. Absolutely, absolutely, that's key. Now that may come as a surprise to people because they think that once you've had one procedure, you're not necessarily going to need another one, and that's true for the vast majority of people. That's what we aim for, but. One thing people need to understand is like any other form of treatment, any other form of treatment, right? Revision, repeat, rearrangement mm -hmm. could be necessary, right? This should not be any different for bariatric surgery. So if that were to happen, for instance, a person who has had a stiff gastrectomy, for instance, could struggle with heartburn, with reflux, which we know mm -hmm. sometimes can get worse with, with the sleep. If that's the case, the person could be treated with medication. And if that person doesn't want to stay on the medications for long, we can change their procedure to gastric bypass. Yeah. And sleep is very much amenable for that. But if you run into problems after you've done the gastric bypass, your options are very limited. That's why very often I try to explain this to people so that they don't necessarily go and have a much more complex procedure when a less complex procedure would do exactly the job for them. And that's important for people to understand. So uh, the procedures that we mentioned uh, up to now, they are, uh, they are surgical procedures. Now, they're also uh, with the 35 and over BMI, but there's also a gastric balloon. We were the first in Delaware, uh, and maybe in the some part of the East Coast, we were the first. It's um, certainly in the tri-state area. Tri-state area, area. Yeah, absolutely. So the gastric balloon, uh, so these are... These are not three different gastric bones. This is the process, uh, process of it. Like the first yeah. one is in, and then the last, the far yeah. right is the, uh, the done part of it. So um, yeah. who is uh, who can benefit from the gastric bone? What type of procedure it is and uh, what complications the patient may have from it? Absolutely. So with the gastric balloon, as, we, as you mentioned, what we're doing are essentially is we're introducing this big ball and depositing it in the stomach. And when we deposit in the stomach, it creates a sensation of fullness. The good thing is we don't have to make an incision on the skin to do this, right? We can actually enter the stomach through the natural opening, which is our mouth, guided by a camera. We can go, and this process is called endoscopy. We do endoscopy all the time. So we're able to go, identify the stomach, and if we don't see any contraindications, we are able to place this balloon, inflate it, fill it with fluid, deposit in the stomach and come out. And that's a 15 to 20 minute procedure. The patient will be asleep when we do it always, right? Who would benefit from this? Generally, the gastric balloon is really not for severe types of obesity. Most often it's really indicated for class one or class two obesity, people who have a body mass index less than 40, but sometimes around 40 could be applicable as well. Mm -hmm. A very important point here to understand is that the gastric balloon cannot stay in the stomach indefinitely. It's a foreign body touching the inside lining of the stomach. So it cannot stay there forever. It has to be removed. And the timing we have right now is six months. So the person will have the balloon for six months and they will have this sensation of fullness for six months. But the program that goes with it is a 12 months program, which means that they will be seeing a nutritionist every month throughout the six months they have the balloon, but also beyond that for another six months mm -hmm. as well. The weight loss is generally going to be around 20, 25, maybe 40, 45 pounds on the upper side. Some people may do better than others. Uh, in terms of complications, there are no as serious complications as the ones you could see, for instance, with the big procedures, but complications can happen with the balloon as well, whether it's heartburn, ulcer formation, uh, perhaps abdominal pain, and probably the more serious complication would be what would happen if the balloon were to pop, right, and get deflated. Well, it becomes smaller and then it can escape the stomach and enter the intestine and it can cause bowel blockage. That is not a common occurrence, but it can happen. But we do have ways also for monitoring that. For instance, the fluid that we fill the balloon with, Kamal, has a color, right? And if the balloon pops and starts leaking, the person's urine will change to the same color as well. And so we're able to alert uh, ourselves that the balloon has popped and we can go in and remove it before it travels into the intestine. But that would be one of the more serious complications that can be seen with the balloon. Of course, like all the procedures, none of these are magic answers, Kamal, as you know. All these are tools. They're powerful tools, but they're tools nevertheless. 
and how the person really <clears throat> buys in into committing themselves to a healthy lifestyle with the way they eat, the way they stay active is going to be important in their long-term success with any of the procedures we do. And that's why we have a program, right? We don't have a surgeon's office. We have a program, meaning that when somebody enters our program, they are enrolled into a fairly extensive process of education and evaluation that involves all the nutritionists that he introduced at the beginning. And all this is monitored through the care coordinators, uh, conferences that you lead every day so that patients really uh, uh, are appropriately screened, educated, and evaluated before they enter the program so they can be successful in the long term. Well, that's, that's uh, part of our, uh, one of the main reasons for our success in our program is because the multidisciplinary uh, approach not only is accepted, but it's a daily practice um, for us. So uh, patient selection process, supporting the patient. Uh, that brings me to my um, next uh, question. Mm -hmm. Just before the session, actually, we had uh, Dr. Uh, Rick Hung and uh, Steve, um, um, I should remember the names, uh, Colada, Dr. Mm -hmm. Colada. They are the, one of whom is the medical director and the other one is the chief physician of the state. Uh, oh, I actually asked them the question of um, uh, surgeries uh, such as bariatric, hernia, gallbladder. These are not elective surgeries. So they are elective in terms of patient uh, choosing which day they are going to have the surgery, but they, are not, they may not be urgent, but they are not elective. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm yes. pretty much against using that term elective. And uh, now two and a half, about going into the third year with the uh, COVID in the beginning, how uh, people are actually, um, uh, you know, start just delaying the process, uh, procedures, not doing the procedures. But then what we find out later on, 65% of the patients who have people who have uh, COVID positive, they have 65% is morbidly obese or uh, obese. So this is a big number, which make the uh, complication of uh, the outcome uh, for mm -hmm. the patient much more difficult. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's something that we want people to know that delaying this is not the right uh, decision, especially mm -hmm. most of our patients who delay it, as I mentioned in the beginning, they do actually gain more weight so what would you like to say about that, Dr. Rizal? Well, absolutely. I mean, that there, really, there is not very much to add to what you say. That is absolutely correct. First of all, uh, you know, the issue of looking at bariatric surgery as an optional procedure mm -hmm. is wrong, right? It really uh, trivializes the severity of morbid obesity, which in essence is the problem that our society has been really uh, been for a long time, right? Looking at obesity as if it was something to joke about, rather than looking at it as something serious in terms of the person's health. And bariatric surgery is an extremely serious you know, form of treatment that uh, is the best and most effective treatment we have right now. So to say to somebody that bariatric surgery is in the same line as having you know, a cosmetic procedure like uh, uh, you know, uh, liposuction or... Uh, you know, <laughs> okay, <laughs> right? Uh, it, 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 it really is a complete misunderstanding of the issue and it doesn't serve well to our patients. But, but then you raised another very important issue, come on, right? And that is COVID actually preferentially affects worse people who have higher body mass indices, right? So our patients are actually worse victims of COVID. So getting the surgeries done before they're affected by this pandemic, which looks as if it's gonna be staying with us for quite some time, should be a big priority for us, as opposed to discouraging people to have, from having the surgery. What is more, and this is really the irony of the situation, is that COVID restrictions lead to increases in weight, right? Just because people are restricted at home, there are not as many activities, there is the stress, there is the hoarding of food, all things that encourage weight gain as opposed to weight loss. Yes, we have to continue to educate our patients about the importance of healthy life, about the importance of healthy eating, right? So that we can control our weight that way, but that is just not enough when it comes to bariatric surgery, right? We're celebrating the new year right now, Kamal, and guess what? Probably the most common resolution 
is going to be, I am going to lose weight. That's what people are going to do. But it is the most common every year. And why is that? Because it doesn't work, right? Whatever we do doesn't work. And for people whose weight has gone out of control, where the body mass index is 40, yeah. so 45, that's, that's, a, that, that's the main, exactly. main thing. That we may have resolutions and you may be able to achieve that, but not everyone is lucky. Absolutely. Absolutely. The group that we are dealing uh, the patient population we are dealing with is not a lucky group. They're not in that lucky group. So uh, this is, you know, the, you and I, we spend so much time to educate people around us uh, and public to understand this is not like me gaining 20 pounds or you gaining 20 pounds. It is a different level of a problem, which is not easy without a surgical intervention. Uh, and then everyone deserves a better life. And absolutely, you want to be part of that. Yes. I mean, on that point, a very, uh, on that point of what is really characteristic of a body mass index of 40, right? What people need to understand is when they see somebody walking at a weight of 350, 380 pounds, it's not just the suffering, the difficulty that that person has in moving around, in doing their daily chores, or the number of medications that they're taking. The fact is that once you get to that weight, not only it is almost impossible to lose weight by yourself, almost impossible, but that weight actually invites more weight gain. In other words, for somebody at that weight, it's very easy to gain 10, 15 pounds. Very easy, right? And then take that year after year. So you see a patient in that situation and you see them a year later, their body mass index will have added three, four, five uh, digits from where they were, right? So when you are dealing with weight of that level, just talking to them about go and change your diet or do your exercise, really does not serve them very well. Yes, they have to do those things as well, but they need powerful tools, very powerful tools like bariatric surgery. Absolutely. And we are, we are here to help. And yeah. we're hoping that uh, more people can take advantage of this. And we do see that, or like we have, uh, like we are not doing this session, these sessions to get more patients. We are actually trying to reach out to patients who are already in, in, the, in the program. So, um, and also more education for those who may already have the surgery. So okay. that's what we are trying to kind of cover in different sessions. Hopefully uh, we'll be able to do this on a weekly basis as we just did it in the last uh, two years. So Dr. Gal, uh, thank you so much again. Uh, thank you, Kamal. Appreciate so it. We'll see you next week. And then thank you for everyone joining us. Uh, we'll be back next week, next Friday on the Bariatric Friday event. And until then, stay safe and have a nice weekend. Bye-bye. Thank you.